It's one of the hallmarks of our modern age that we require our heroes to have a little bit of dirt on their faces, perhaps even a little bit of blood on their hands. Witness the Punisher, Dr. Gregory House, Jack Bauer, Jessica Jones, most contemporary interpretations of Batman, the Sherlock version of Sherlock Holmes, and Godzilla. And since we like our heroes to carry around a certain amount of moral ambiguity, it only makes sense that we'd have a similar preference for our villains. Popular examples of this include Loki, Magneto, Mr. Freeze, Omar from The Wire, the Smallville version of Lex Luthor, and, of course, Godzilla. For my money, Star Trek's best examples of both these types are to be found in, and I know this will come as a shock, Deep Space Nine. There's my main man, Captain Sisko, who established his anti-hero cred by poisoning the atmosphere of an inhabited planet to catch a former officer who betrayed him to join the Maquis, and followed that up by conspiring with Garrick to trick the Romulans into declaring war on the Dominion, an operation that involved not only forgery and bribery, but also some murders to which Sisko was a self-admitted accessory. And on the opposite side, we have who else but Captain Sisko's arch-nemesis, Gul Dukat. In fact, the writers of DS9 and Mark Alimo, the actor who played Dukat, did such a great job of making him a complex, three-dimensional character that some fans of the show don't think of him as a villain at all. Are those fans onto something? I'll explore that possibility in this video, which is a little something I like to call, Is Gul Dukat Actually a Hero? Gul Dukat was the main recurring antagonist on DS9. He was there in the pilot, he was there in the finale. All told, he appeared in 35 of the show's 173 episodes and played a significant role in major storylines during all seven seasons. From the beginning, Dukat was something other than a shallow, mustache-twirling bad guy. His initial interactions with Sisko are cordial, if a little tense. In the early seasons of the show, we see Dukat acting as an ally to our heroes on more than one occasion. He teams up with Sisko to investigate the Maquis in Season 2, though they turn out to have very different approaches to that particular problem. He turns up to assist the DS9 crew in the third season episode, Civil Defense, although he only really tries to help once he realizes he's been trapped on the station by an automated security system that he had installed himself years ago. And hey, when Sisko and Jake fly a Bajoran light ship all the way to Cardassia, Gul Dukat is there to greet them and launch some celebratory space fireworks. Does that sound like something a villain would do? Did Khan ever set off fireworks for Captain Kirk? Well, there was that. The view of the character offered by folks in the pro-Ducat camp sees him as a reasonable, essentially honorable person who, yes, has done some bad things, but also has a capacity for kindness and honesty and great potential to do good if only he could be redeemed. And many insist Ducat was ripe for redemption for almost the entire series, right up until about halfway through Season 6. That's when Deep Space Nine presented an episode that a lot of folks in the pro-Ducat camp consider to be their least favorite episode, at least where the portrayal of Ducat is concerned. That episode is titled, Waltz. We're several months into the war between the Federation and the Dominion. Ducat, who had orchestrated Cardassia's entry into the Dominion with himself as leader, has been captured and is now in Federation custody. Captain Sisko and Ducat are being transported to appear before a grand jury when their ship is attacked and destroyed. Sisko wakes up on a strange planet, badly injured, and there's Ducat, like, hey buddy! Looks like you got a little singed when the ship was blowing up. Busted a wing, too. But not to worry. I got a distress beacon broadcasting. I'm gonna go find us some food. You just lie back and relax and let old Duke take care of everything. Thanks, Duke. What are you gonna do with him? Are you gonna kill him? He kinda has it coming, don't you think? Quiet, you! Hey, are you shooting phasers at hallucinations? I said just lie back and relax! Ducat's not in a good place. 
mentally in this episode. Besides Wei Yun, he also experiences hallucinations of Damar and Major Kira. And it also turns out that he's not actually broadcasting a distress beacon after all. He seems way more interested in having a heart-to-heart -heart with Sisko. Eventually, antagonized by his hallucinations and frustrated by Sisko's refusal to admit that maybe the evil Gull Dukat isn't such a bad guy, Dukat loses it. That's also when the episode itself loses the pro-Dukat camp. Dukat smacks Sisko in the head with a piece of the transmitter, knocking him unconscious. When Sisko comes to, Dukat is all, you brought this on yourself. I know you think I'm this huge asshole, but who appointed you supreme arbiter of who's an asshole anyway? And Sisko's like, weren't like five million people murdered during your tenure as Prefect of Bajor? And Dukat's like, oh, even more would have died if I hadn't been there. And Sisko's like, okay, but if you punch an innocent person in the arm, you can't say you did a good thing because you didn't punch them in the groin. And Dukat says, come on, man. I wanted to be cool to the Bajarans. I improved their medical care. I gave them more food. I ended child labor. But did it make a difference to them? No. They tried to assassinate me. They blew up an orbital space dock, killing 200 Cardassians. So of course I ordered that 200 Bajarans be executed in return. I mean, what else was I supposed to do, man? Meanwhile, Dukat's hallucinations of Weyun, Damar, and Kira are standing off to the side like Cisco's like so how's come them Bajaran bums didn't appreciate what a swell guy you were to them and Dukat's like it's because they're the inferior race and we Cardassians are the superior race and that's not my fault I didn't make things that way that's just how it is I didn't choose for them to be inferior. I didn't make them practice their hokey-ass religion. I didn't force them to wear those tacky earrings. And I sure as hell didn't give them those lemon zester noses they have. I mean, where do they get off acting all proud like they're just as good as Cardassians? And Sisko's like, the nerve of those Bajorans. Maybe you should have just killed them all. And Dukat's like, you're right, I should have. Oh man, I should have turned their whole rotten planet into a graveyard. And then Sisko smacks Dukat with that same piece of the transmitter, and he's all like, and that's why your tote's not evil at all, buddy. Sisko makes it back to the shuttle that Dukat used to get them away from the destroyed ship, but before he can take off, Dukat jumps him from behind and throws him back outside. Right before he leaves, Dukat says, By the way, I'm going to destroy Bajor now. The whole planet is as good as dead. Bye! So, yeah, the pro-Dukat folks don't like that episode so much. There's one particular term they use to describe it, a term that I saw used over and over again on message board threads and subreddits as I was researching this episode. Character assassination. The writers of Deep Space Nine took a complex three-dimensional character and flattened him out into a cartoonishly evil supervillain. Or so goes the complaint. But is that what really happened? The main objection from people who don't like how Waltz treated Dukat is that it erased all of those shades of gray that had made him so compelling up until that episode. And it's definitely true that Dukat becomes much more of a straightforward bad guy from that point forward. In the series finale, he's ranting about setting the entire universe on fire, and it's hard to get more super villainy than that. But I don't accept the premise that Dukat's portrayal in Waltz is a character assassination by the writers, or a retcon, or inconsistent with how his character had been portrayed in the series up to that point. I submit that his shades of gray were mostly the result of Dukat's refusal to admit the truth about himself and his crimes, crimes which we knew about long before Waltz. The writers of Deep Space Nine didn't just decide to make Dukat evil in season six. He was evil all along. The Cardassian occupation of Bajor was bad, really bad. It's easily one of the darkest events ever portrayed in Star Trek. From the very beginning of the series, the writers of Deep Space Nine make it plain that the occupation is meant to be read primarily as an allegory of the Holocaust. In the celebrated first season episode, Duet, Kira describes what she saw when she liberated a forced labor camp near the end of the occupation. 
except for the Trek-specific details, she could easily be describing the scene at a Nazi concentration camp in the last days of World War II. And who was in charge of the occupation of Bajor? Dukat was. In fact, the episode Wrongs Darker Than Death or Night establishes that Dukat was Prefect of Bajor for over 20 years, though that episode was produced after Waltz, so Dukat's defenders might prefer to disregard it as another component of the writer's character assassination slash retcon of Dukat. Regardless of how long Dukat commanded the occupation, it's established very early on that the occupation of Bajor was brutal, that Dukat loved his job as Prefect of Bajor and didn't want to leave, and that despite the brutality of the occupation, Dukat sees himself as a benevolent figure relative to the Bajarans. Dukat repeatedly characterizes his actions during the occupation as justifiable, even praiseworthy, and attempts to persuade others, particularly Sisko and Kira, to see them that way too. And because Dukat is so multifaceted and played with such conviction by a fantastic actor, I understand why some fans of the show are so reluctant to view him as a true villain. Deep Space Nine is a great show, and Dukat is a great character, one of the best characters on the entire series. But he's also a space Nazi who presided over a planet-wide holocaust. I'm not sure we should be so eager for such a character to find redemption, no matter how brilliantly realized or fun to watch he is. And even if Dukat's redemption were possible, attaining it would require him to face up to the reality of his crimes during the occupation, to acknowledge the unfathomable level of suffering he was responsible for, and to show some degree of remorse. Dukat never shows us that he's capable of doing any of that. For him, redemption doesn't lie in confessing his sins and trying to right the wrongs he's done. It lies in convincing others to agree with him that he wasn't so bad after all. And that's not the behavior of a person who wants to clear his conscience and redeem himself. That's the behavior of an abuser who wants to get away with his abuse. Dukat's role in the occupation and his utter lack of remorse regarding it would be more than enough to land him squarely in evil bastard territory. But as it happens, long before Waltz, Deep Space Nine gave us a few other examples of Dukat making choices that are pretty unforgivable. For instance, there's the fourth season episode, Indiscretion, where it's revealed that Dukat had a Bajaran mistress during the occupation, and they had a daughter together. A daughter Dukat intends to murder. He doesn't murder her, of course. Kira talks him out of it. And that child, Torazial, goes on to become a recurring character so dull that I bet some of you never even realized she was played by three different actors. And why should you? It doesn't matter. Anyway, Zial is sometimes cited as evidence for the good side of Dukat, because not only does he refrain from killing her, like a good dad, but he takes her back to Cardassia with him, a choice that costs him the rest of his family. So he does a noble, selfless thing that's in the best interest of his child, right? Yes, but the selfless nature of Dukat's rescue of Zial is undermined by her subsequent appearances on the show where it becomes clear that Dukat is less interested in her as his daughter than as something he can use to demonstrate to other people, mostly Kira, that he's not such a bad guy. With Dukat, it always comes back to him trying to force other people to see him the way he sees himself. Also, let's not gloss over the fact that Dukat raped Zial's mother. That's not how Dukat sees it, of course. He insists to Kira that he really loved her, that it wasn't like that with them. But even if we accept that Dukat's account of their relationship is basically factually reliable, Zial's mother was still essentially a slave. Sex without consent is rape, and consent can't happen in a relationship where one person has all the power, no matter how superficially loving they might be. 
Speaking of Zial, she's present for not one, but two super evil things that Dukat attempts but doesn't actually accomplish. The first is, of course, her murder, which fair play Dukat chooses not to follow through on. The second is something that, if we wanted to, we could read as foreshadowing of his final season cartoon supervillain phase. Remember when he tried to blow up the sun? This happens in the episode By Inferno's Light, which I previously talked about in my Worf video. While Worf, Garrick, Martok, and the real Dr. Bashir are plotting their escape from the Jem'Hadar prison camp in the Gamma Quadrant, on the other side of the wormhole, Dukat, who has just taken control of Cardassia, which has also just joined the Dominion, is preparing for an attack against the Federation, with help from a changeling disguised as Dr. Bashir. As Deep Space Nine readies for the arrival of a Dominion fleet, the Bashir Changeling commandeers a runabout and heads straight for the Bajaran sun. He's carrying a bomb that, if detonated inside the star, would trigger a supernova that would wipe out the entire Bajaran system. Bajor, Deep Space Nine, where Zial is living since Dukat left her there in Kira's care, and all the ships that had gathered to fight the Dominion. Billions of people would presumably die. The Defiant, commanded by Kira, intervenes and destroys the runabout before that can happen. At the end of the episode, Dukat calls up Sisko on subspace, and he's like, hey, congratulations on thwarting the whole blowing up the sun scheme. We almost had ya. Sisko says, yeah, you almost killed everyone, including Zial, your own daughter. And Dukat says, Zial made her choice. As far as I'm concerned, she's no longer my daughter. And Sisko's like, and here I was starting to think you weren't such a bad guy, but it turns out you're even more of an asshole than I thought you were. And Dukat says, one man's villain is another man's hero. Anyway, you should see the monument they're erecting in my honor here on Cardassia. It's pretty dope. If there's a more perfect and succinct summary of Dukat's character in the series, I don't know what it could be. One man's villain is another man's hero, and by the way, they're building me a monument. Not everyone likes Dukat's storyline in the final season, when he becomes obsessed with freeing the Pa Wraiths from their prison in the fire caves and using their power to destroy Bajor. And that's fair. Dukat is less ambiguous and more of a conventional villain following Walsh, there's no doubt about it. But the turn he takes in that episode isn't a retcon. It isn't character assassination by the writers. It's faithful to everything we know about the character up to that point. The only reason Dukat's villainy was ever ambiguous was because the writers didn't force us to confront how evil he truly was. They allowed Dukat to be charming, seductive, funny, even let him appear principled from time to time. But the evidence of who he truly was was always there. He made us forget that he was the guy who commanded the occupation, who assaulted Bajaran women, who opposed Cardassia's withdrawal from Bajor, and who straight up tried to annihilate the entire solar system. But he was never not that guy. He was a villain who thought he was the hero. And he was so compelling that he convinced some of us to believe it too. But that doesn't make him a hero that makes him the most dangerous kind of villain. And that's something we would all do very well to remember, not just as it pertains to Dukat, but to people who live and breathe and manipulate and lie and abuse here in the real world as well. This concludes my presentation. <laughs> Don't you smile at me, you evil motherfucker. Hey folks, hope you enjoyed this one. Thanks for watching. I know the last few of these have been pretty heavy with the Deep Space Nine content, and even though it's by far my favorite Trek show, I recognize there's a lot more Star Trek for me to talk about. So for the next Trek Actually video, I'm going to revisit probably my least favorite corner of the franchise, and that would be Star Trek Voyager. It will be a Star Trek Voyager-related topic for the next 
Trek Actually video. In the meantime, if you enjoyed this one and you haven't seen any of my other Trek Actually videos, the links are in the description and also over there somewhere to the rest of the playlist. Check out the other Trek Actually videos or some of my favorite things that I've done for the channel and all my years on YouTube, and I hope you appreciate them and enjoy them as much as I enjoy writing them and making them and doing all of this stuff. If you got something out of this and you want to help me continue making videos like this, you can support this channel through my Patreon campaign. Go to patreon.com slash Steve Shives to become a patron of this channel for as little as $1 a month, but if you think I'm worth it and you can't afford it, you can pledge as much as you want, and I highly encourage you to do so. But don't take those $1 a month pledges for granted. They really, really add up and do make a huge difference. So for those of you who are patrons or are thinking of becoming patrons, or those of you who just watched this video because you thought it was funny or you thought it was entertaining, thank you so much for your support, and I'll see you next time.